honesty. To the very last minute, I was indecisive about whether I was going to do this today. I have, if you look at your program, you just see my name, no title for my talk, because I didn't have one to the very last minute. I was almost to the point of not coming here today, all right? But it was because of Celeste Walker and Nicole Adler that I came, because of the work that they put in and everybody that was in charge of organizing this, that I said that I had to do this. And as I sat and I listened to the pieces that I heard, it was almost, it spoke directly to me about the dangers of silence about being, about am I not the brave one, right? And about fear. It's just has become so exhausting for me telling my story over and over again. It might seem like I'm good at it, but every day that I become more conscious of the gravity of my narrative, the harder it is for me to talk about it because I want to distance myself from it so much. Right? But it's things like what Vincent Harding said, the late educator and social justice advocate, that all of us, the entire course of human history, leads us to right here, right now, wherever we find ourselves. And from right here and now, we are obligated, not determined by the past, but constrained by the past, to imagine a future that could restore the innocence of the first day. Innocence was a big part of my life because it was something that I had lost quite early. In 1987, I ran away from home, from Brooklyn, New York, to Philadelphia, hundreds of miles away, joined a group that my mother certainly would not be proud of. And for the next four months, I engaged in activities that was very, very questionable. I sold drugs, right? Because I wanted to be independent. I wanted to be, I wanted to plunge myself into adventure. I wanted to break the rules. I wanted to prove that I wasn't a chump. In one of the houses, an explosive act of violence took place. And I was arrested for the murder of another member of the organization. Sentenced at the age of 15 to mandatory life without parole. I've been released now for about 15 months after serving 30 years. I went in at 15 in 1987, came out at 45. The lessons that I've extracted from my experiences is what I offer to single mothers who may be raising young boys and young girls who are on the verge of doing something rash, like thinking about running away, and to society who, it seems, have embraced a culture of condemnation, right? It was only because of a series of US Supreme Court rulings that said that it's unconstitutional to sentence children to mandatory life without parole that I'm standing here before you today, right? And I know that you have me here not because you celebrate what I've done or you honor what I've done, but you have me here knowing my situation, knowing my narrative, because you believe in possibilities, because you believe in hope. When I was sent to the Super Bowl by Malcolm Jenkins and the Philadelphia Eagles, some news outlets thought that, hey, what is this country coming to sending a murderer to the Super Bowl? I imagine that if those same outlets knew what Arcadia 
and TEDx was doing here today, they probably would ask, what is this country coming to, giving audience to a murderer? But I know that's not what you're doing. I know that there is a yearning for hope, for a dose of hope in this hopeless narrative of crime and punishment, crime and punishment, crime and punishment, ad infinitum. There has to be a better way forward, right? And this is what got me to get out of the bed, right? Call the Uber and come to Arcadia University today. Because right now, we are in a crisis. And the crisis is beyond the 2.3 to 2.5 or 2.7 million people within the physical confines of mass incarceration. The crisis is about what mass incarceration does to the rest of the 320 million of us, All right? When we make peace with these monuments of misery that have popped up over the landscape like the chicken pox over the last 40 years, when we make peace with that, when we are okay with that, when we say to ourselves that it's a necessary thing because it's justice, whatever we tell ourselves to convince ourselves that this is the right thing to do because the people that are in there deserve to be in there, rather than the question, what do we deserve? Do we deserve to identify with this kind of um, justice system? Right? When we get to that point where life can become normal alongside these monuments, these toxic chambers of human warehousing, then it has become a different type of crisis. It has become a national health crisis, a national spiritual crisis, a national soul crisis. Right? I have blood on my hands that I will never be able to get off. Right? That ended up on my hands at the age of 15. I would, 30 years of incarceration could never get it off. And no amount of good that I have done or will do ever can ever get it off. I recognize that. And so I've convicted myself, not about what the system convicted to, but what I've convicted myself to, a life of sacrifice and service for years. But that won't change that. Regretfully, there will always be this horrible thing attached to my narrative, right? And now with my son, who's now four months old, and I look at him, I'm challenged with this question of how do I have this conversation with him when he gets old enough, when I have to tell him when he's old enough to understand what I had done, right? Because that's a secret that I'm not going to keep from him. The challenge that we face as a society now is how do we, how do we become more fully human, right? How do we, because ultimately it's about the kind of society we want to leave behind. Do we want to leave behind a society that's more conducive to children, 15-year-olds like me, making better choices? Or a society that exacerbates and exploits the vulnerabilities of children? Right? Are we in the business of what I call the five insidious peas? Producing people with problems and then punishing them for it for profit. Are we in that business? What is happening to us as a society? Right? We have to question that. This is bigger. This is bigger. Mass incarceration is bigger than just about managing the monsters. It's bigger than that, right? It's about what's happening to the rest of us on the outside. How are we 
allowing this to change us. Because I tell you, for me, nothing kills the soul more quickly and absolutely than a secret about a murder, right? What do you tell yourself when you have this secret tucked away that you did something like this? And so it may have been good that I was arrested about a week after this happened. What would have happened if I had gone a month or a year and nobody knew that I did this? What would I have told myself or been telling myself day to day in order to make life normal while I had this human spirit, this light that I snuffed out, right? This great purpose, this infinite potential that I interrupted, that I trespassed against, and I have, it's a secret. What would I have been, what would I have become? I would be a totally different person quite possibly standing before you today, right? Likewise, what do we tell ourselves every day to make peace with the kind of justice system that we have, right? And it's not, a, again, again, I believe in accountability. I believe in accountability. Account there is no healing without accountability. But accountability is not languishing and rotting away in a cell, generating profits for corporations and industries. Accountability is those who have committed harm like me being hands on with bringing balance back to the communities and the families that we have left in imbalance, right? The cosmic implications of what I did is never lost on me. I have left a, a tear in the fabric of life, a hole in the cosmos that'll never be filled. But it is my duty, it is my duty to be more than that, to join the struggle to make violence and victimization no longer characteristics of our communities, right? Last year, there was 1,370 Six shootings in the city of Philadelphia alone. 351 fatalities. So life without parole, mass incarceration is not helping to stop or reduce violence. If mass incarceration was about stopping to reduce violence, then America would be the least violent nation in the world because America incarcerates more, bodies, more people than anybody else in the world. Right? Five times the world's population, 25% uh, 25, 25 of the world's population, 25% of the world's imprisoned population, more than any other country in the world. Yet in terms of gun violence and mass shootings, we're up there. And we're almost due for one. Isn't that how the narrative has been going? We're almost due, as, as sad to say, we're almost due for another mass shooting. When it happens, we'll talk about it in the news cycle for, for about a week and a half, milk it in the 24-hour news cycle. We'll have a political con, we'll reduce it from a human issue to a political conversation about gun rights and gun, gun, gun laws and, and Second Amendment rights and both political sides is gonna argue and put on all kind of political theater and then we'll forget about it until the next mass shooting. This is the twilight zone type of narrative that we're stuck in right now, right? But we have to imagine a way out of this because we can be better, y'all. We can be better. We can be better as a species, right? We can be better as a system, as institutions. We can be better as a culture, right? And so I'll end with some words that resonates with me, it throbs in my mind, especially as I was riding on up here, by author Wasco. It's a poem. We are the generations that stand between the fires. 
Behind us, the flame and smoke that rose from Auschwitz and Hiroshima. And within the American context, I'd like to in insert, and that also rose from Rosewood and Tusla, Oklahoma, Black Wall Street, and Osage Avenue in Philadelphia, and Waco, Texas, right? And other places, right? Before us, the flame and smoke of a flood of fire that's consuming the whole earth. It is our task to make from fire not an all-consuming blaze, but the light in which we see each other more fully, all of us different, all of us bearing one spark. We light these fires to see more clearly that the earth and all who live as part of it is not for burning. We light these fires to see more clearly the rainbow in our many colored faces. Right? Blessed are the, is the one within the many, and blessed are the many who make the one. Right? It's about what kind of world we're going to usher in. Because like James Baldwin said, an old world is dying and a new world, kicking in the belly of its mother, time announces that it is ready to be born. The birth will not be easy, and many of us are doomed to discover that we are exceedingly clumsy midwives. Right? The challenge for us is how do we bring our hands together in care and compassion, right? To help deliver this new world that's calling on us to deliver it, right? That's the challenge for us in the days ahead. That is the challenge. Now is the time for building our power as a community for loving each other more, for supporting each other more, for keeping each other safe, right, in these perilous times, for looking deeply at society, seeing what's anti-life, anti-wrong, what's wrong and what's anti-human and anti-nature about it, and coming up with ways to fix it, right? And the way to do it is not with warehousing each other, right? But just like Dar Daniel Sered said, and until we reckon, just as we will not incarcerate our way out of violence, we will not reform our way out of incarceration without taking on the question of violence. What is driving our society to be so violent, to commit such trespasses against each other, right? Thank you for your time. Bless your hearts, bless your spirits, right? Salutes to all of you, right? And thank you for having me. Thank <laughs> you.